Hi, afternoon. So today I would like to talk about how we used Mesospim and unit deep learning in order to do three-dimensional modeling of embryonic development and disease in frogs. So we work with frogs. It's our favorite animal model organism. Um, it's an obligate aquatic uh, model organism, which features free swimming larval stages. And there are certain advantages of working with frogs. They are very well positioned to do human disease modeling and the extent that they have external embryonic development. And this means that they're easily accessible and manipulable. Further, they are positioned on the evolutionary ladder somewhere in between zebrafish and mouse compared to humans. And their genome is actually quite synthetic to the human genome. And this actually means that for 79% of currently identified human disease genes, there is in fact an ortholog in Xenopus. And frogs are also peculiar in a way that one can do tissue restrictive targeted microinjection. So what this means is that if you have a two cell embryo, the left and the right axis is predefined and there are almost no cells which still cross across the midline during development. So this is actually in direct contrast to most mammalian species. This also means that if one, and this is like an example, um, delivers a fluorescent tracer dextrin to one side of the animal, 20 hours post injection, this will be nicely retained on one side of the animal. And this is quite nice for us because it allows us to deliver certain experimental manipulations only to one side of the developing frog tadpole. So for instance, here in this eight cell embryo, and this is another peculiarity of frogs, is that the pigmentation basically is a dead giveaway of which cell type is gonna give rise to which structure. But let's say that we target something on the left side, for instance, by injecting an mRNA, in this case, GFP. Again, it's nicely retained on one side. But maybe more interesting, if we do CRISPR-Cas9 targeting, injecting CRISPR only on one side of the animal, we're able to create this half transgenics in which one side um, is still normal and the other side, uh, the gene is edited. So in this case, we're editing a gene called tyrosinase, um, which is an important in pigment um, production within the frog. So we use this to do human disease modeling. And I'm just going to go through some examples real quick. So um, one of the, so we've injected these CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we order them as synthetic systems from IDT. So it's actually as easy as ordering primers. You don't have to um, do anything crazy here. And we inject these on one side of the animal. And this is an example from a while ago in which we were able to show um, both polymelia or the development of multiple limbs on one side of the animal or the development of amelia, the complete absence of limbs on one side of the animal. And this was in the context of a story of hereditary limb defects, which was wind signaling related, or a more recent story about um, from Dr. Getwan from our lab, which investigated ciliary chondrodysplasia, a human disease, where also one-sided injections led to um, gross limb malformations, but also, as you can see on the CT from the kidney, in this frog uh, cysts on this one side of the animal. And this actually brings us to my disease of interest, which is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So this is the consequence of either PKD1 or either PKD2 mutations in patients, and occurs at an incidence of a baffling one in a thousand people. So this is actually the most common genetic disease which is known to man. And it is characterized by an ever increasing um, amount of cysts, which gets ever larger as the patient ages. And in the end, it will lead to a decline in the healthy tissue and stage renal failure. And there is no curative treatment. There's only supportive care at this point. And this would be then either dialysis or transplantation. And just to make a point how big these things can actually get. So this is uh, Dr. Muller from the Spital Turgo, um, which has successfully taken from a patient here over 22 kilograms of polycystic kidney. So we actually wanted to establish novel animal models to investigate the pathological uh, hallmarks of this disease. And for this, we injected PKD1 CRISPR-Cas9s unilaterally within the developing embryo. And we performed whole mount immunostaining and very traditional BABB clearing, which works very well for us because the samples are only a couple millimeters big. And as such, we were able to show comparing to a tyrosinase crispant, which is a control here, 
which develops normal kidney tubules, that the PKD1 crispins presented with massive cystogenesis, which followed a um, scala of phenotypes ranging from mild tubular distension to almost fully cystic kidneys. And we quantify this while the kidney area doesn't necessarily get bigger, what actually kind of happens is that qualitatively the kidney changes and looks as it gets um, more cystic. Then I told you it could be the consequence of PKD1 or PKD2 mutations. So we also validated this with the other gene, again, unilateral injections, looking at the left kidney in this case, control injections, nicely looped tubules, PKD1, uh, sorry, PKD2 crispins showing the cystogenesis, which we validated also just to be sure in a stable line where only PKD2 homozygotes develop the cystic kidneys. So one of the things is that we used to do this with stereo microscopy. And if we're looking at left and right kidneys, this really means that we have to painstakingly turn every embryo, flip it to the other side to take a picture from the other kidney. And this actually takes a lot of time. Plus this did not really give us any three-dimensional um, context. So we then turned these samples to the mesospim. So this is a unilateral PKD2 injected animal. So what we can, one can appreciate is that on the right side of the animal, there is a normal developing kidney. You see the normal tubules, while on the left side, you really see the cystogenesis happening. Of course, we then had these large data sets and we wanted to do feature extraction. We asked questions like, how big is the kidney on one side compared to the other side? So we started easy and tried to do um, what any biologist will probably do is uh, turn to MRIs and try to do simple intensity thresholding. Now, as you can see, this did not really work well um, and segmented much more than only the kidneys. There was then an additional problem. If you look at this kidney here, the proximal part of the kidney is much more stained with the LE lectin, um, and the distal part of the kidney is much more stained with ATP A1. So actually to get the full kidney context, one has to integrate both signals. And we kind of merged this, tried this with Imaris. Again, it didn't really work. So we turned to um, unit deep learning architectures. So I just like to state that all the deep learning that I'm going to show and the rest of the talk is actually done using Fiji plugins developed by the University of Freiburg by Torsten Falk. So you do not need a computer science degree anymore to be able to do these things. Um, so we did train this, what we call 3D Nephronet. Um, to accurately segment out only the kidneys from these kind of images. And this then allowed us for the first time to really look in a three-dimensional setting to the disease models that we, were invest that we are investigating. As one can see here, a normal tubular structure in the tyrosinase crispant, which once again is kind of like an injection control. And on the PKD1 crispins, on the ever-increasing phenotype you see here left and right, from local tubular distensions to massive cystogenesis, the model performed well. And this now allows us to do more pronounced uh, feature extraction and analyses that we weren't really able to do before. For instance, here we used uh, skeleton, topological skeletons and uh, medial axis transform to get a kind of heat map showing the measure of how much the tubal, the kidney tubal is dilated at a, at a place in um, the kidney. So um, at this point, I would like to shift gears a little to another um, organ system and another disease that we have been studying. So I would like to talk about 6-1 related bronchiotorenal syndrome. So patients present with um, otic, so ear malformancies, usually congenital deafness, and also uh, abnormal abnormalities in the craniofacial structure. So recently, Kopenrat and Tavares modeled this in Xenopus, and one can indeed see comparing a 6-1 heterozygote to a 6-1 null here, that there is a difference in craniofacial structure, which is the dark blue. And this is a staining by Alchin blue, which is a very classical chemical stain that is still mostly used within the field. Uh, one can see that these abnormalities are very similar to what is seen in the, in the mouse model, which already existed. So we wondered, can we in fact use this mesospin to go beyond these kind of 2D um, stereo microscopy things? So we optimized a collagen 2A1 stain to work um, within our tadpoles, 
uh, together with a DRAC5 uh, far red nuclear stain, getting these um, images now in three-dimensional, almost full isotropic view. At this point, we then again train the neural network to be able to segment out the craniofacial cartilage from these large data sets, um, which is basically coming up now, and thus allowing us to once again um, look at the segmentations in order to get uh, feature extraction, get quantitative data from this. And indeed, we trained his models to be performant across different pathological states, which is not that easy to do, because as you train a neural network to recognize something like the baseline, in this case, a wild type, if things change too much because you know, you're having a CRISPR with a pathological state, um, they sometimes lose a lot of accuracy. So we went past this by uh, generating a tra training data sets with um, ever increasing craniofacial abnormalities. We did this by uh, exposing the tadpoles to BMS453, which is a retinoic acid inhibitor and increasing concentrations, this decreased craniofacial cartilage. And we're able to train our models to be consistently accurate across these pathological states, which then allowed us to do feature extraction, for instance, in this case, the relative cartilage surface. At that point, we turned with a little fine tuning to do this craniumnet on or uh, BOR model tadpoles, where one where we could now, in fact, three-dimensionally reconstruct the abnormalities seen in the 6-1 homozygous knockout line compared to the 6-1 heterozygote, which has a normal appearance here. And then these segmentations allow us the feature extraction, such as the volume of the craniofacial cartilage, also the distance between the quadrates, which is a measure of the width, and the serratohial angle, which is a measure of the height. And then finally, and this is work from Paulina Ogar in our lab, we really want to move towards whole animal phenotyping approaches in a more unbiased way. So what this tadpole is stained with DAPI, a nuclear stain, a double um, immunostain, but also an hfnf one beta fluorescent in situ hybridization stain, so basically recognizing RNA. And this quadruple stain was used to train several neural networks to recognize anatomical structures, even those, for instance, like the brain here or the eye, which we did not specifically label for. And as such, we're hoping that we can create the networks that allow us to do an unbiased phenotyping of our disease models as we move forward with this. So in conclusion, I hope that I showed you that Xenopus is useful for modeling human disease, especially now after the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution. We've established novel animal models for polycystic kidney disease that we believe are amenable for higher throughput studies. We are able now to access the third dimension in craniofacial cartilage development and disease. And we are um, currently hoping to move towards whole animal phenotyping approaches. With that, I would like to thank the people involved in the work, the funding sources, and evidently you for your attention. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the great talk and, and cool insights from like ranging from disease modeling all the way to Super cool image segmentation. Thanks. So, um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat or raise your hand. And maybe go ahead and um, ask a very general question, kind of stepping back a little bit. Like, um, you know, by the you know standards of the deep learning field, UNET is an absolute classic, right? And so maybe you can shed some light on what are the segmentation tasks that UNETs are really good for, and what are some of the limitations where one has to consider other architectures? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for most things that we do, UNET still performs relatively well. And this is probably because um, we have a very standardized way of taking images. Um, so, you know, our tadpoles are usually positioned in a certain way. Um, and because we run 2D networks to it, it basically gets more or less the same 
kind of information all the time. And this also allows us to use relatively small training data sets and relatively small training times. Um, I, so yeah, basically long story short, for us, we don't really need the extra depth or the extra performance um, from more advanced models. Okay, yeah, um, I think- I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so you, uh, when you uh, image uh, DAPI channel, um, I presume you use four or five laser and do you have issues with high scattering? Um, what people um, usually have? Yeah, actually we see very little of this. Um, yeah, I don't, cannot really explain why, except that our BABB clearing um, actually works well very well for frogs. Um, so we see very little scattering even in the 405. Um, I mean, also uh, relaying back to um, the samples that Fabian showed earlier. Um, yeah, seems to be fine. Thanks. I can quickly comment on that. So th this is like a general discussion maybe because we, we often tell users that using 405 and DAPI is not a good idea. Um, this is a bit the exception of it because usually it's a play in mouse brains when the samples are so huge that you will see a massive intensity gradient and it will be very, very hard to um, get good data out of this. But the good news is that for embryonic tissue, where you, which is super young, only a couple of days old, and secondly, for these um, like um, yeah, very, very young stages, also like in chicken embryos, so usually uh, four or five excitation works fine. So that's kind of the exception to the rule. Uh, everybody who's doing mouse work is for most <laughs> organs, so please, you know, try to shy away from UV excitation. Um, there's also a question from Marco Pender, um, who asked how much tissue deformation uh, you have with the BABB clearing, so like shrinkage or so. Well, evidently there's some. Um, I wouldn't really call it deformation. I mean, there's there's definitely shrinking going on, but it seems that in most cases. Uh, we don't really have major aberrations from it. Um, so we also compared or DAPI uh, sagittal sections to, you know, known, hist um, known atlases of, of Xenopus development, and we didn't really see anything oddly abnormal there. So we feel in our case, it's fine. There's possibly, again, the consequence of our tissues being only a couple of millimeters big and the dehydration and the clearing just happening yeah, fast and um, well distributed. Okay, are there further questions? Uh, please yeah, raise your hand and unmute yourself or... Um... Uh, yeah, just, just very quick, uh, very cool talk. Uh, I, I have the exp experience in the axle auto when I do dehydration-based clearing that the uh, shrinkage is very anisotropic. But actually, I think you answered the question really nicely. You have a quite small sample, so embryo states are shrinking quite isotropic. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I did notice at some point, I, I did try this with you know much larger specimens, or let's say three, four weeks old, and then it does look like yeah, these artifacts are starting to become apparent. So I think I'm, we are just like in the lucky time window which allows us to, you know, use traditional BABB clearing and fast methanol. Um, actually, this whole staining, well, the whole um, dehydration and clearing process only takes a good 24 hours in our hands. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if you have a special trick to avoid uh, this type of uh, yeah. shrink uh, shrinkage artifacts, but okay. Yeah. Not really. Since you're fine. <laughs> good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Very nice talk. Thank you.